microspectroscopy. My name is Peter Troost, and on behalf of Zytec and our partner, Advanced TechnoSales, we would like to welcome you. First, just a couple of housekeeping items. If you're calling in over your phone, please mute it um, during the presentation just for background noise. Um, please ask questions via the chat tool. We'll answer as many as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. And if we cannot answer your question by the end, we will certainly get back to you via email or a phone call. This webinar will be available on our website, www.zytech.com, in the coming days. Our presenter today is Dr. David Shearing. Dave is a founder and principal here at Zytech and continues to be a contributor in the development of authored over 25 papers on various aspects of vibrational spectroscopy and holds a PhD in analytical chemistry from the University of Miami in Ohio, where he is also an adjunct professor. With that said, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Shearing. Thank you very much, Pete, and thank you all for uh, being available to listen to our presentation today. Uh, I also want to recognize my co-author, Tony DiDomenico, who did most of the work that you'll be seeing today. So first, we'll talk about uh, what, uh, what we're going to talk about today. Very briefly, we're going to review infrared spectra. Briefly, we'll talk about uh, the surveyor, which is an FTIR micros microspectroscopy uh, instrument that we use to collect all of the infrared spectroscopy data that we're presenting. Next, we'll present to you some of the tools that we use to prepare and present samples to the instrument, and also some of the sample analysis modes that um, we can employ to simplify and collect high quality infrared spectra from micro samples. Lastly, we'll demonstrate uh, some of the, the analysis results that we can expect to get using these methods. So infrared spectroscopy involves uh, the vibration of molecules, and in this is this figure on the right hand side in the movie, we see two of the vibrational modes of water and the absorption bands in the spectrum that are due to the coupling of the infrared radiation with the electric field of the molecule as it vibrates. At the specific vibrational frequencies where the infrared radiation is in resonance, we will see an increased vibrational amplitude in the absorption, the transfer of energy from the incident field to the molecule. So these areas where peaks are observed are very characteristic of molecule of interest, very highly specific, and is extremely useful in characterizing materials. So, in the, in the normal mode of operation, infrared spectroscopy is a bulk technique, and we measure the, the mass in which we're able to analyze materials in milligrams, the size in millimeters. Coupled with beam condensing, op, beam condensing optics, we can extend the, the range of measurement into the micro domain, where we can measure masses as small as the picograms uh, mass range, and samples that are micrometers in dimension that come close to the wavelength of light that we utilize in the, in the spectrum. Microscopy, microspectroscopy, we tend to use those words interchangeably, uh, allows you to characterize or identify something which is small. By coupling a microscope with infrared beam condensing optics, we're able to view disparate areas of the sample, isolate them for measurement. Uh, it's non-destructive, and as we said in the previous slide, the IR spectra are very rich uh, in their detail and can provide an identification 
or allow you to elucidate functional group information from the materials that you're characterizing. Shown in this picture on the right-hand side is a very simplistic view of the power of microspectroscopy. Here we have three an aluminum substrate measured in reflection, and the corresponding spectra uh, show that these areas are chemically disparate. You could look at the detail in the spectra and see differences due to the pigment uh, and the other additives in the binder. The applications of infrared microspectroscopy are very, very diverse and include problem solving in, in manufacturing, defect analysis, analysis of contaminants on various different uh, products or substrates, uh, art authenticity or conservation and forensic, uh, and so on. So as we said in the in the beginning of the presentation, we utilize the surveyor. So the surveyor is different than most FTIR microscopes, FTIR microspectroscopy systems, in that it interfaces with virtually all FTIR spectrometers. It's customer installable and can be removed, taken in and out of the sample compartment. Uh, it receives all of its power and data connection via a single USB connection, USB 2.0. Also with the system, we've developed a clip-on diamond attenuated total reflection uh, element that allows you to record spectra and view samples uh, through the diamond ATR element. Uh, it has a very large depth of field of view and a very large field of view, which makes it easy to easier to locate uh, samples. Uh, we have three infrared measurements modes. We'll talk about that uh, subsequently in the presentation. Transmission, reflection, ATR. With, uh, with FTIR spectrometers and the fact that it's sample compartment mounted, you can use the instrument's own detector and not require liquid nitrogen for cooling. Um, and then also it's a very compact system, which makes it uh, a, a portable solution as well. So one of the features that we emphasize with the surveyor is our illumination options, which include uh, uh, reflection, reflected light illumination, transmission illumination, but also oblique or dark field illumination, which is especially useful with many practical samples. Uh, it's useful with samples that, that scatter, like this paint chip that you see on uh, the left-hand side, and you can see that these images appear uh, against a, a, a dark field, and that there's excellent color contrast and very good images, even through our ATR crystal, which brings up the, the next subject. So what we've done with Surveyor, which is a little bit different than most systems that you would encounter, is that we employ a single crystal synthetic diamond as an attenuated total reflection element. And we can also view specimens through that element that allow us to locate them and ensure confidence in hitting the mark, as it were. Uh, we also can visualize contact. So on the, on the right-hand side, you see this wetting effect where this micro bead has content that it minimizes sample preparation for appropriate samples. And it's also a surface selective technique. So for some samples, we can actually measure a, a particle or a defect on a surface selectively without, uh, without measuring the spectrum of the underlying, underlying surface contribution. With Surveyor, we employed integrated video microscopy software that we call eSpot. And this allows us to control some of the features of the system, including the targeting aperture dimension, which you see in the graphic. So this is a 100 micron aperture uh, on a Kevlar fiber, which is viewed uh, in transmitted light illumination in this case. We also can control our infrared modes uh, 
of type and uh, uh, analyze uh, and, and document our images and save them to, to, to disk as either a TIFF or a, a JPEG file. So now let's segue into microspectroscopy sample preparation, which is one of the most important aspects of microspectroscopy practice. So the quality of the spectrum that you get out of a microscope, FTI or microspectroscopy system, is very much dependent on the preparation of the sample. And one of the more important issues in sample preparation is sample thickness. So it is a common issue that, that uh, samples can be optically thick, bands can uh, be totally absorbing and therefore limited in, their, in, in your ability to uh, actually uh, determine chemical composition. So we want to make sure that we present a sample or measurement that has appropriate thickness. Sample preparation begins with kind of the physical nature of, of the sample, its size, its hardness, uh, if it's a contaminant, if it's a material uh, that's, that's uh, multi-phase, what are the other components and properties of uh, those materials. So these are some examples which show kind of the diversity of samples that one might encounter in FTIR micro, microspectroscopy, including solid crystal mixtures. Uh, this is an embedded impurity in paper. Many times we would like to measure specimens like this with ATR uh, because we don't have to prepare the sample. But also many times, this is, this is also the case, you can see fibers are actually extending over this impurity. So this impurity is embedded. And these types of impurities actually need to be excised from the substrate and prepared separately and, and measured uh, um, outside of its particular substrate. Here's a defect in a polymer packaging material, and this is just a fiber on a glass fritted filter. So this was a sample uh, that was filtered uh, from liquid. And uh, you can see that, that it's residing on the surface of the glass in this case. So an indispensable tool, uh, indispensable tools in preparing samples, stereo microscope, both fine tip uh, for moving and manipulating smaller samples, and blades, uh, uh, some sharper than others for cutting and sectioning. So this is a very simple kit which would provide most, if not all, of the tools you would need for basic, practical, infrared microspectroscopy sample preparation. As I said, a stereo microscope is indispensable. Stereo microscopes come in, in many shapes and sizes and capabilities in terms of magnification, working distance. Do you have a a camera port, you want to record images or movies uh, under your uh, stereo microscope. You can get a stereo microscope like this one with perfectly to prepare most of what one would need to prepare samples. And you can get these for a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, more sophisticated systems like, like the Leica system shown on the right hand side cost several thousand dollars but have a much larger range of magnification, more working distance, more flexibility, and a camera port to uh, record uh, images if you so desire. Uh, we need uh, greater than 30x magnification in our stereo microscope to handle samples that are smaller uh, than 100 micrometers. That's an important uh, thing to remember. Uh, probes and forceps are indispensable in moving and manipulating samples. Uh, this moving and manipulating samples sounds like a daunting task to do, and you can manipulate samples that are as small as 10 microns or even less with the appropriate tools. And one of the main things in manipulating smaller, smaller samples 
is the fineness of your probe or your forceps. The finer the tip, the smaller the sample you'll be able to manipulate. And a particularly fine tip probe are those that are fashioned from tungsten, tungsten needle probes. So these can both be purchased or made from tungsten wire. It's a fairly simple process to make an extremely fine pointed tungsten needle probe uh, from tungsten wire and sodium nitrite. Heating it in sodium nitrite will etch the tungsten and make a very, very fine tip probe, which then you can put into these, what we call pin vices. And this will allow you to manipulate and move really extremely small samples. Uh, we also need sometimes to cut samples. And uh, various blades have different sharpnesses. Very sharp blades are needed to, to cut some samples. The exacto blade, that are exhibit, exhibited in the roller knife and this exacto knife actually are not particularly sharp, relatively speaking. So a scalpel blade or a um, um, actually a double edge razor blade, which which you have to be very very careful in using, are much sharper actually than an exacto blade and can be more useful with samples that require uh, a very sharp blade, for instance, a soft rubber sample. One thing that we did not mention or show a picture of in the presentation that I want to point out uh, right up front is that common one by three inch glass microscope slides are indispensable substrates for sample preparation. They cannot be used uh, uh, for infrared microspectroscopy analysis as substrates. Uh, however, they are very inexpensive uh, disposable substrates that you use in the initial manipulation and preparation of samples before transferring those samples to an appropriate substrate for infrared measurement. What I'm showing you on this slide are a couple of substrates that are, are useful uh, for infrared measurement. And the first is a glass microscope slide, which is actually more than 99% reflective to IR light. This can be used for uh, samples that are, 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 are fairly thin or samples that are deposited from solution onto the substrate. And one can measure samples in a reflection mode, a double path uh, reflection mode. These are standard one by three inch uh, format and can fit into the sample clip uh, of, uh, of the microscope. Uh, they are easily scratched, which is a downside. Uh, and they're not recommended for ATR measurements without further support because they're fairly thin and delicate. One of the most useful uh, uh, techniques or substrates for FTI or microspectroscopy measurements is the low E glass slide. Uh, low E glass is a glass substrate that's coated with a very thin film of silver, very transmissive to visible light. So we can observe the samples in all illumination modes, oblique, reflected, and transmitted light. But we're measuring the sample in the infrared via double pass reflection. So as with the gold microscope slide, we have to have an appropriate thickness of our sample to get good data. This is also a very good substrate for ATR measurements because the slide is thicker and with the maximum force that we recommend applying via the diamond, which is about 15 pounds, these slides hold up over that entire uh, range of force. We also can uh, put transmitted light uh, substrates, whether it's infrared crystals or diamond windows, into three-hole uh, slide mounts. And these accept the 13 millimeter diameter infrared transparent windows. Compression cells, and this is uh, an example of a compression cell, can be used for flattening or holding materials uh, uh, 
flat over the entire field of view. Some samples will have a tendency to not lie flat, uh, and therefore pieces of the sample will be in and out of focus, depending on where you're at on the sample. So if you have a transmission compression cell, like the one shown, you can hold the, the, the samples flat over the entire field of view. And uh, also, uh, particularly with diamond windows, you can do some further flattening of the sample uh, in the cell to get an appropriate path length. In transmitted in transmission, so it can be uh, it can it can can be easier to prepare samples of appropriate thickness because you only have one path uh, through the sample. And typically, with uh, layered samples. Uh, those are measured in transmission, and many times paint chips and so on uh, are measured in transmitted light illumination as well. Transmitted light infrared spectroscopy, I should say. So some of the, the infrared windows that we can use in a compression cell for a three-hole mount uh, slide, uh, potassium bromide is a general purpose material. It is transmissive through the entire range of the instrument uh, and the, the detector mounted in the instrument. Uh, they're fairly fragile and hygroscopically. I think selenide is, is harder. Uh, it, it is water insoluble. So if you're working with wet material, you might want to use a material like, uh, like zinc selenide or barium fluoride. Um, and uh, the downside of zinc selenide is that you can see it's it's, it's a yellow color. Diamond is a very strong chemically resistant uh, substrate. We can pre prepare samples on diamond without transferring them. In other words, the sample manipulation procedures that we're going to demonstrate later can be done on a, a diamond uh, uh, substrate, including thinning the sample with some fairly aggressive force. You won't scratch the diamond. Uh, and diamond is chemically inert with anything that you would want to, to use for cleaning. And the spectral range extends from the far infrared all the way up into or close to the UV. So we can actually obviously observe samples in transmitted light, uh, illumination, reflected light, illumination, etc. The diamond windows that we fabricate fit within that 13 millimeter diameter um, uh, size, so it will it is interchangeable in the cell or the three-hole uh, slide mount with uh, these other infrared substrates. So with multi-layered uh, samples, uh, there are various methods that you might want to use for sectioning. And uh, in, in layered samples, some of these layers can be extremely thin. 10 micrometers or less, which which can um, challenge infrared micros microspectroscopy analysis, making these thin layers thicker, effectively, and easier to analyze. So a microtome is a fairly sophisticated instrument that takes uh, some training and technique to master. Uh, they can be relatively costly but they can be both automated and manual. Uh, there are lower cost, less, 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 less flexible options for sectioning. Shown on the bottom uh, is the EV slicer, which allows uh, the sectioning of samples from zero to 45 degree angles uh, using a, a circular uh, blade, which using the knob uh, here, you actually trans translate that blade over your sample, and you can also control the sample size of, um, of um, sectioning. Uh, an even lower cost op option is, is the slicer attachment to the microbyte, and these come with attachments that allow you to uh, section samples uh, at zero to 15, or I'm sorry, 30 or 15 degrees angle using a simple blade. So it's a little bit harder to control your thickness with this method, but it's a very inexpensive uh, solution. 
Uh, so there are other uh, miscellaneous tools that one could invest in to help simplify analysis. One is a microvice, and a microvice is useful for um, oddly shaped that you want to you want to hold in a particular orientation. So it allows you to grip the samples, and it interfaces into the standard one by three inch stage clip. Uh, the microtouch pen allows you to pick up small samples. Uh, it has a very small has a very small adhesive tip, and when this tip is, uh, retracts, the sample drops onto the desired surface. If your hands are not steady, there are various micro manipulator options that incorporate imaging as part of the micro manipulator. Uh, very expensive solutions along these lines are available that completely automate uh, the process of, of moving and transferring uh, samples and can be used to transfer extremely, extremely small samples uh, is is used. Uh, so as we said, as we said in the in the introduction, uh, the the surveyor and other microscopes have the ability to measure samples in attenuated total reflection mode, reflection mode, or transmission. How do you choose the best sample uh, measuring technique? This really many times depends on the sample itself. So attenuated total reflection is is useful uh, both in terms of minimizing sample preparation for some samples that may require no preparation, but it requires you to physically touch the sample. And uh, also um, um, an advantage of attenuated total reflection is that the sample thickness is determined, the sample thickness is determined by the refractive index ratio of your sample to uh, the ATR element. So that's very helpful in sample preparation and, and getting a very representative uh, uh, path length of sample for infrared analysis. However, the size of sample that you can measure is larger, effectively larger with attenuated total reflection. You can measure smaller samples with reflection or transmission infrared. In reflection, as we mentioned, light passes through the sample, reflects off an underlying substrate, and back through the sample. For some samples, it can be hard to thin the samples to the extent required to get an appropriate path length in using reflection infrared. An example like without actually having something to compress the sample, uh, it could be very difficult to get that sample to a thin enough sample size. In transmission, light passes through the sample one time, so uh, the thickness can be uh, smaller due to that. And as we said earlier, we can compress samples and, and thin them into a sandwich uh, configuration to get that appropriate path length. So these are some samples that can be measured with ATR. On the left-hand side is actually a contaminant on the surface of a pharmaceutical, which is observed through the diamond ATR crystal. And in this case, we were able to selectively measure that, uh, that another on the right-hand side, this is a microplastic that was from filtered water from the Hudson River. And this was moved and transferred to a low glass slide and, and measured in uh, ATR mode. So these samples in ATR are generally larger than 100 uh, micrometers in dimension. Mixtures can be a, a common issue in microspectroscopy samples. And multiple me methods exist for separate, separating and analyzing these different mixture components. In fact, uh, infrared microspectroscopy is very powerful in, in, its, in its ability with the microscope from the observation, from the micro microscopy observation, inferring that these materials are of different uh, composition simply because they're of a different habit. And this is called Pasteur separation, separating particles by different appearance or habit. 
So this is a mixture uh, uh, analysis uh, performed with micro ATR, a mixture of citric acid and sucrose. And via the microscopy, we're able to differentiate the different crystals based on their habits. Uh, particle one, which is citric acid, uh, is circular or spherical, spheroid shape um, um, crystal. Uh, sucrose is more rectangular or cubic in its in its uh, in its habit, and we could selectively touch these crystals. We're observing them on Lowy glass slide with oblique illumination, and measure the spectral contribution of these materials uh, separately. In the very top spectrum is the spectrum of a, of a, of a mixture of sucrose and uh, citric acid. So in reflection, uh, this is not attenuated total reflection now, this is reflection absorption, re measuring by reflection of a sample that's on a reflective substrate. In some cases, there are no sample preparation because it's on a reflective surface, a metal. Uh, of course, gold is the most reflective, but other surfaces that, you know, stainless steel, aluminum, um, um, even other metals are highly reflective. And uh, samples on them are amenable to uh, infrared spectroscopy analysis directly. So on the left-hand side, slide, there is a contaminant film right in here that was observed on a metal uh, surface. This was a product uh, problem uh, where there was contamination on these metal parts. And we collect the background off a clean section, uh, a reference spectrum off a clean section, and then a uh, ratio spectrum off of the contaminated uh, surface. And we're able to get a spectrum of that material uh, directly. We can also transfer samples to reflective surfaces. So this was uh, this red fiber we showed you before was on a glass filter. As it turned out, uh, this glass filter con contributed a contribution in ATR mode. So we removed the fiber from this glass filter substrate and transferred it to Lowy glass. So now we're observing the specimen in transmitted light, uh, bright field illumination, but we flattened a portion of this fiber out, and now we're able to measure it with, with reflection uh, on this Lowy glass substrate as we observe the sample in transmitted light illumination. I should say that the Lowy glass substrate, and so that's an advantage over some of the more uh, cost-effective infrared substrates, KBR, zinc selenide, are not durable enough to, to flatten samples directly on the substrate. So they need to be flattened before placing on the substrate and then uh, uh, measured there. So we're going to show a movie of, of the procedure, basically, of how you transfer and flatten a material uh, to make an appropriate path length for infrared spectroscopy analysis. So first we're going to locate, you can see that there are multiple samples on this uh, uh, substrate. We are going to target one of the fiber samples with a fine tip probe. So we're going to go in and get the get the red one. You see, just by touching the sample through electrostatic interaction, it is on the probe. Next, even though this fiber is very thin, it is optically thick. So for the best quality spectra, we want to thin it and get an appropriate path length. We use a device that I showed earlier called the roller knife. And then we're able to measure the spectrum of that material with very high quality. The red spectrum in the top is the spectrum measured in reflection from low E glass compared with a polyethylene terephthalate 
fiber on the bottom. So the bands are, are on scale, would be perfectly amenable to uh, a, a spectral library search method or a functional group analysis through expert spectroscopy uh, practice. So multi-layered samples, or 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 as I said before, samples which uh, are, are can be difficult to to thin, and are not amenable to ATR analysis, can be measured by transmission. And this is a multi-layered packaging material, and you can see that it has two layers. Uh, this was sectioned, uh, actually, with a with a scalpel and then put into a compression cell with KBR windows in this case to, to hold it uh, thin and in focus uh, across the field of view. With a microscope, we just targeted uh, these separate areas. You can see that we have a white layer and a clear layer on the uh, spectra on the right, shown in transmission. We can see that the material in both cases is polyethylene. However, in the case of the white layer, there's some additives, uh, probably titanium dioxide, but other materials as well that are uh, par probably part of the pigmentation of that uh, of that particular particular sample. Uh, another aspect in transmission analysis is that many of the commercial spectral database are databases are actually transmission libraries. So uh, that can be a factor uh, in, in, in selecting uh, a technique for analysis. There are many, many more. H many of the libraries are, are transmission libraries. So lastly, we're going to show you an example of a relatively simple sample, but uh, in terms of observation, but a fairly complex sample analysis and that's the paint chip. So paint chips are multi-component, or paints are multi-component materials that consist of binders, pigments, uh, other additives, either, either fillers or extenders. And uh, to analyze all of the components of, uh, of a paint, uh, which can be important for uh, art conservation or authenticity, or in forensic analysis, uh, takes a little bit of, of technique uh, in analyzing complex samples. So here we have a, a red commercial paint, uh, which is imaged, this is an artist paint in this case, which is imaged, imaged with uh, oblique illumination. Um, we measured the, 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 the chip in reflection mode, in this case with 160 micrometer aperture, and the sample is fairly thick. Uh, we see do, we do see uh, decent band de definition, but nevertheless the bands are fairly broad, particularly these strong bands, and the sample is a little thick. So what we can do is use some on-slide solvent extraction methodology. So this takes a little bit of practice, experience, and 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 testing, but we can gent gently heat the material with ethanol solvent, and some of the material will be transported from the very particular region of, of the paint ship. And so we've gone over to a region where some of the sample was obviously transported. We have a film here, and we come in and, and measure a very high quality spectrum in the red, very good sample thickness. Of, of the binder material, which is consistent with a vinyl acrylic copolymer material. So in this case, we're measuring material that is separate uh, from other materials in the, in the paint composition. If we go back to the paint chip in this area where we've extracted the binder away, we can get a contribution which is mostly due to the pigment, which is consistent with pigment. Although that, that paint chip was very, very brilliant red, 
the concentration of pigment is actually quite low, and we cannot see much contribution, if any, from the pigment in the spectrum of the paint ship, which has not undergone uh, this kind of separation or manipulation. With that, I'd like to conclude and would be happy to answer any questions that we have uh, in the time uh, that we have available. And if you would like to contact us separately, uh, here is all of our contact information, and we'd be happy to converse with you regarding your problems. Hi, Dave. Uh, one question came in. Um, you mentioned the surveyor uh, does not need liquid nitrogen. What kind of detector does the surveyor use? So the, the surveyor is different than all, I would say, it's true to say, all microspectroscopy instruments on the market in that it uses the instrument's own detector. So in most cases, uh, the instrument has an instrument mounted DTGS detector, which comes with your spectrometer. Uh, and all of these spectrometers you see on this image uh, now being displayed from the various different vendors, uh, all of these have DTGS detectors installed in the instrument in MCT detectors, which are more sensitive and require liquid nitrogen cooling. So the surveyor can also be used with those instruments too, with those detectors, because it uses the instrument mounted detector, the detector that comes with your FTIR. The surveyor itself does not have an infrared detector installed in the instrument. It utilizes the, de the, the, the instrument uh, mounted detector. Great, thanks, Dave. And another question is, um, um, what, what are the benefits, again, of having the view through ATR? The benefits of having the view through, you're able to observe the sample through the ATR with the microscope, visually, optically. You can record images through the ATR, and you can center and focus your image uh, uh, looking through the diamond ATR element. The other material that are utilized in ATR. Germanium is common. Silicon is common for FTIR microscope systems. You cannot see through, the, see through these. So you have to observe and focus your sample with the ATR crystal out of place, not in the field of view. And then you either have to slide it in or, um, or uh, push it down. It depends on the design. And when you do that, you're no longer able to observe your sample. So the simple answer to this, you have confidence that you're hitting the sample. With those other uh, ATR crystal materials, uh, even if you're measuring a spectrum, you're blind and you're not 100% confident that you're hitting the sample area of interest. Uh, also, what, what I didn't mention, it, uh, is that with the diamond, you can observe the sample contacting the diamond surface as well, wetting the surface of the diamond. So that gives you added confidence uh, also that you're measuring the sample area of interest. Thank you. And uh, one more question um, is, uh, how does this, the surveyor, compare to a more traditional IR microscope? Um, one that, you know, the, uh, maybe from, from Thermo or, or Perkin Elmer. I think, I think the main differences are that it is customer installed and removed. So you can use it when you need it. It's not permanently mounted. It can be permanently mounted. You just leave it in there. Um, uh, so that's one aspect of it. Uh, I think that it's relatively simple to use. Uh, in comparison, uh, it's much like a microscope you'd use in a high school or freshman biology class uh, in terms of, of the microscope controls. 
also uh, it has, as I said, a large depth of field and a large field of view. Those are different things, but both of them are ease of use features, which allow you to locate samples uh, a more easily and valuable tool on a relatively low cost platform. Uh, Diamond ATR uh, on uh, uh, permanently mounted FTIR microscope systems can be almost as much to purchase as is the surveyor. So you're getting that. Uh, that value in a very economical package. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you all for attending. This concludes our webinar for the day. Um, again, if you have any follow-up questions, there's contact information um, on the last slide. And um, certainly this webinar will be available on our website in the very near future. Thanks again and have a great day.